I'm sitting here in Antarctica and it is raining. We're standing in puddles of water. The mud is, is thick. We're looking at these baby penguins, tiny babies. They shouldn't be that small this time of year. Tiny babies shivering and, and absolutely soaked. And their parents are trying to keep them warm and their nests are filling with water. It's, it's the most heartbreaking thing I've ever seen, honestly. We have to wake up and see that this is happening all around us and that this, this is real. Antarctica is melting down. And this is going to affect everybody all over the world. What you just saw was from February 2023, and it wasn't my first brush with climate change. Just last year, fires were raging up and down Colorado's front range and all across the continent. I could see billowing black smoke from my front yard. A thousand families lost their homes not 10 miles away. And the place where I'm sitting, not two miles from our house, also burned down as I stood in my driveway watching the ash, the spirits of the forest, float down all around me. My name is John Weller and I'm a photographer in Colorado. I've devoted much of my life for the last 20 years to helping to protect Antarctica. It all started for me in 2004 when I read a scientific paper by Antarctic ecologist David Ainley, who identified the Ross Sea Antarctica as the last intact marine ecosystem on the planet and that it too was under threat. At the time, I knew almost nothing about the ocean, and the idea that we could be down to just one last intact place shattered my innocent view of the world. So I went to meet David Ainley. We became partners and soon found filmmaker Peter Young, and the three of us committed to work together to call for a marine protected area in the Ross Sea. I didn't know at that moment that I was starting on a 12-year journey that would bring me to the Ross Sea five times, make me learn to dive so I could get under the ice steer me to a lifetime of collaborators and supporters across the globe, and even lead me to my wife, Cassandra, and eventually our children. We started a movement in our garages that would become a global coalition of organizations, scientists, diplomats, and more than a million people, and eventually entrain the attention of world leaders. Those 12 years of effort came to a head on October 28, 2016, at the annual meeting of CAMELAR, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, when 24 countries and the EU unanimously established the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, the largest MPA in the world, and the first international MPA. By that time, both Cassandra and I were delegates to the closed door meetings, so we saw it happen. And I wish everyone could have been there on the floor of CAMELAR when, after a roller coaster of negotiations, the gavel finally fell. This room full of international diplomats absolutely erupted. People were standing and cheering and crying. Nations were literally hugging other nations in this room. This was a massive win for Antarctica, a massive win for the global oceans, but this was also a peace treaty. And it made me believe that if enough of us speak up and commit ourselves, to making the world a better place, and that's just what we can achieve. But my last experience in Antarctica drained these beliefs. It was the most desperately hopeless I've ever felt. This was, this was covered in snow 14 years ago, and now... It was so dark, I couldn't stay in that place. And the only way I know to find my way out of darkness is through knowing. So I went to talk with somebody who knows a lot more than I do. Palmer Station is located on the West Antarctic Peninsula, one of the most rapidly warming regions on Earth. And behind the station is a glacier. And this glacier has been retreating at about 10 meters per year over the last 60 years. We have warming oceans, warming air temperatures, decreases in sea ice, and this sets up 
a bunch of cascading effects to the ecosystem. For example, the Adelie penguin, their populations on the peninsula, in particular at Palmer Station, have been decreasing by over 90% since the mid-70s. This is really the question of my research. Why, why are these populations changing and what are the main drivers? My name is Megan Semino and I'm a biological oceanographer at UC Santa Cruz. I study seabirds. They're just incredible indicators of climate change, just this incredible window into the ecosystem. We're seeing some really dramatic things play out. If we start at the base of the food web, there's two main species, one diatoms, which thrive if it's a cold year, and then cryptophytes, which are a smaller phytoplankton, do better when it's warmer. Krill, which feed larger predators like penguins, seals, and whales, can't actually physically eat cryptophytes. They're too small. Krill have these feeding baskets, and the cryptophytes just go through their fingers. But salps, which are these gelatinous zooplankton, can eat cryptophytes. Penguins, seals, and whales can't survive on a diet of salps. Krill also rely on really good winter conditions, like good sea ice for spawning. And since the mid-1970s, where we have satellite observations, the sea ice has been retreating earlier and earlier over time. And this past year especially was one of the lowest sea ice years ever recorded. With this trend, krill have not successfully spawned in the Palmer area for about seven years now. This just makes it a lot harder for the top predators like penguins and whales to find food. Another one of the things that we're seeing change with warmer oceans, and you'll get more evaporation, and so you get this really moist atmosphere. And so it's getting stormier, and there's a lot more precipitation. For penguins, um, it can be a real problem. Some colonies will have more snow accumulate, so some parents were laying their eggs really late, so it's hard for their chicks to acquire enough weight to survive their first winter. Also, small chicks don't have waterproof feathers, so they will get really wet and cold. That can have really catastrophic impacts on the survival of these chicks. In the Palmer Station area, there's not a lot of direct fishing pressure, but for Adelis or chinstraps that are migratory, that are relying on food in other areas further north, even if you're taking a very small percentage of the total krill population, krill fishing is impacting penguins. And because our colonies are so small, anything that could reduce their survival, we need to try and avoid. We do need to get on top of our emissions and management so to make the most of what's going on right now in the world. Adali penguins have been breeding in the Palmer area for I think about 600 years. We've already seen an island-wide extinction of Adali penguins in this area and that happened in 2007. There's a few other islands that are very close to an extinction. For some of those, we're just waiting when the last year is going to be. It doesn't look good for them. Over the same period, Gen 2 penguins, they're sort of more flexible seabirds. They've actually moved in. Their populations have exploded by over 300% since the 90s. In terms of the future, it's obviously really hard to say, but somehow Gen 2s are making it work now. I'm an optimist, so I sort of choose to have a good outlook. You know, Adelie penguins may not breed at Palmer Station forever, but I think that niche will be filled by other penguin species, and you know, hopefully we'll have some sort of healthy population that continues to live there. I guess, is it okay I'm an optimist? Does that make oh, it sound, I, no. does that make it sound like? No, no, no. <laughs> I don't want it to come off like everything is fine, because <laughs> it's not, but. <laughs> it's strange, actually. Most of the scientists I talk to are, are optimists. 
We are sitting in Sawhill Ponds, and this is just outside of Boulder. And this is the place where I grew up. It's a place that I come to reconnect. And now I bring my children out here too. My daughter, Adele, and my son, Orion Ross. Both of them named for different aspects of the Antarctic, the Adeli penguin and the Ross Sea. What kind of world are they gonna, are they gonna walk through? That's the question we all have to ask each other and ask ourselves. And if you think of it that way, and you think about these beautiful little people walking into this unknown world, these, facing these challenges, it just, it just, I, I don't know how to put it all into words. That's what we have to understand, is that this isn't a story about creatures at the edge of the world. This is a story about our own children and about the world that they're going to inherit. And that's why what Megan said is so important. There's no time for depression. There's only time for action. We have to accept what's happening and move forward. We're already seeing the effects of climate change on top of the damage we've done to the environment from centuries of overuse. And there are some things that we're just not gonna be able to stop. But there's still a reason to fight. And the story in Antarctica and all around the world is not about what we've lost. It's about what we have left to save. We need to make that choice to choose optimism and inform it with science and compassion. And then let's all act together in the face of these challenges. We've done it before, and now we have to do it again. We have to do everything we can, at home and at the ends of the earth.